My name is Sharon Langley, and this is A Ride to Remember, written by myself and Amy Nathan, illustrated by Floyd Cooper. I hope you enjoy it. I love carousels. The horses come in so many colors, black, white, brown, gray, and a honey shade of tan, sunny yellow, fire engine red, and even a soft baby blue. But no matter their colors, the horses all go around at the same speed as they circle round and round. They start together, they finish together. Nobody is first, nobody is last. Everyone is equal when you ride a carousel. When I was a little girl, my family lived in Baltimore. Near our house was an amusement park. It was green and grassy, big and beautiful, bright and shiny. There were rides and games, treats and cold drinks at Gwen Oak Amusement Park and a carousel too. But before I was born, there were no rides or treats at that park for children like me. Was it because kids didn't have money to buy tickets, I asked? No, it wasn't about money, said Mama. Or was it because they lived too far away from the park, I asked. That wasn't the problem either, said Daddy. Then why, I wondered aloud. It was because of an unfair rule the park had, Daddy explained. The rule said that African Americans couldn't go on any of the rides. Could we go there to have a picnic or fly a kite, I asked. No, we couldn't, said Mama. We wouldn't have been welcome there, said Daddy. That's terrible, I said. Yes, it was, Mama said. It was segregation keeping people apart because of their race, treating people differently because of the color of their skin, Daddy added. What about the golden rule? I asked. What about treating other people the way you want to be treated? I guess some people forgot that the golden rule is supposed to include everyone. For a long time, for a long time, black and white kids couldn't do many things together. They couldn't go to the same schools or to the same restaurants and libraries or even sit together at the movies. It was the law. Why didn't somebody do something about those kinds of laws, I asked. They did, said Mama. We did, said Daddy. Many people, both blacks and whites, knew that segregation was unfair and just plain wrong. Some people said, just wait, times will change. But others said, why wait? What's wrong with now? They held protests at restaurants, stores, and movie theaters. They tried to get officials and courts to make new laws to create a better city, a place that would welcome and include all people. By the time I was born, some unfair laws had changed in Baltimore. Kids could go to the same schools and libraries and restaurants and some movie theaters too, no matter the color of their skin. But the amusement park just wouldn't budge. People who were fed up with segregation made plans to hold a huge protest at the amusement park. They spread the word to churches, synagogues, schools, and other places in the community so that people could take part in the protest. They invited newspapers and television stations to report on the protest. They told the chief of police about their plans so the police could help keep the peace. Best of all, they picked a perfect summer day 
for the big event. A day when people celebrate what's best about America, said Mama. Do you know, oops, what day do you think they chose? The 4th of July, I said. That's right. A day that stands for freedom, said Mama. Did they have fireworks? They had something better. Hundreds of people, black and white, young and old, students, teachers, priests, ministers, and rabbis all came together on July 4th, 1963 to take part in one of the biggest protests the city ever had, Daddy said. They believed in the golden rule. That being fair is the right thing to do, said Mama. First, the protesters went to a church to pray, sing freedom songs, and get ready. They spent the morning learning how to be peaceful protesters, how not to use their fists to fight back. Then they climbed onto buses to go to the amusement park. They brought signs and banners that declared their message of freedom for all. When the protesters reached the park, a crowd of angry faces greeted them, people who didn't want the park to change. They shouted insults at the protesters. The protesters just held their signs high and sang freedom songs. We shall overcome. The civil rights anthem filled the air, said Daddy. But when they tried to go into the park to buy tickets, blacks and whites together. The park's owners had them arrested. So they did what they had been taught to do, to protest peacefully. Some sat down on the ground and refused to move. Police officers had to carry them to buses to take them to the police station. Mama and Daddy explained that almost 300 protesters were arrested. Some paid a fine and could go home but half refused to pay their fines. They chose to spend the night in jail instead. When they went home the next day, they began planning another protest. For two days later, on July 7th. Kids help too, Mama said. A newspaper reporter asked 11-year-old Lydia Finney and her aunt, Mabel Grant, to go on a secret protest at the park. They both had light colored skin. He thought the ticket taker might not know that they were black. On the morning of the second protest, Lydia and her aunt walked up to the ticket booth. They bought tickets and walked right in. They could have been arrested if anyone had found out who they were, but nobody noticed. They stayed for two hours, went on some rides, including the carousel. When they left, the protesters weren't there yet, but the reporter was. He interviewed them and wrote about their visit to show what a mistake it was to judge people by the color of their skin. When the protesters arrived for the second protest, police arrested nearly a hundred protesters, blacks and whites who tried to enter the park together. Among the youngest taken to the police station were three young white boys who joined the protest with their families, John, Tom, and Steve Coleman. Photos of these boys appeared Photos of these boys and their parents being arrested and put in a police car appeared in the newspaper the next day. Those photos shocked many people, said Mama. Arresting a family for trying to ride a carousel? Ridiculous, I said. Exactly, said Mama. The stories about the protests in the newspaper and on television, 
made more people decide that segregation had to go. So many people spoke out against the park that the owners saw that they had to change. The park's owners agreed to let everyone come to the park, no matter their skin color. All arrest charges were dropped, too. The first day that Gwyn Oak Park was open to all was August 28, 1963, one month before my first birthday. Mama told me at first that she was afraid to take me to the park. Would we be safe? Would we be arrested? But she and Daddy decided it was important for us to be there that first day as a family. On August 28, 1963, we were the first African-American family to walk into Gwyn Oak Amusement Park when it was open to all. No angry faces greeted us, only smiling news reporters and photographers who rushed around us. Daddy said he marched me straight over to the carousel. He helped me onto a big, smiling horse. He put his arm around me and held my hand so I wouldn't be afraid. Mama stood nearby waving. The photographers jumped onto the ride with us. They took photos of Daddy and me because I was the first African-American child to go on a ride that day. Before the carousel started turning, uh, a few white kids climbed onto the horses beside me. They were big kids and could probably ride by themselves. But one girl's mother asked Daddy to keep an eye on us. To make sure that she didn't fall off her horse, Daddy was glad to help. He kept watch on all us kids, keeping all of us safe. The next day, newspapers had stories about my carousel ride, and there was my name right in the newspaper. There were photos of Daddy and me and of the other kids riding with me. It had been a big new day for everyone who was at the amusement park with us. August 28th was also an important day for a man who was trying to end unfair laws everywhere. Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. On that very day, Dr. King was at a huge protest in Washington, the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. Hundreds of thousands of people joined him to call for an end to segregation everywhere. Dr. King told the crowd about his hopes and dreams that one day black children and white children would live together peacefully in this country, treating each other as brothers and sisters. My carousel ride showed that Dr. King's dream was starting to come true. That was a long time ago. The amusement park isn't there anymore. A big storm destroyed many of the rides and Gwen Oak Amusement Park had to close. Now it's a park where families have picnics on sunny afternoons and where neighborhood kids play ball. On its green grassy field stands a sign to help people remember those who took a stand for justice there. The carousel came through the storm just fine and was moved to Washington, D.C. on the National Mall. It's fitting that it should be there near the monuments that stand for freedom, not far from the Lincoln Memorial where Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. stood to give his famous I Have a Dream speech. My name, Sharon Langley, was put on was put on one horse's saddle and on one of its horseshoes too. A sign at the carousel 
tells about my ride to remember on that sunny August day so long ago. Today, big kids, little kids, young kids, old kids, no matter the color of their skin, can ride on any carousel going round and round on horses painted all the colors of the rainbow. Nobody first, nobody last. Everyone equal, having fun together.